with us today from the University of Cologne. Uh, and he's going to be speaking to us on cycle integrals, theta lifts, and modular forms. Uh, so yeah, go ahead, Josh. Sure. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So like Ian said in the email, this was kind of thrown together last minute. So if there are any questions, if things aren't clear, please just stop me and ask. Um, I'm going to do a bit of background. Um, there will be some technical results thrown in, but not too much. Um, I should also say that some of the um, results are joint with Claudia Alves Neumann, Katrin Bringman, and Martin Schwagenscheid. So these are published results, and some ongoing results and ideas are joint with Paulina Schaaf and Marcus again. All right, so we'll start with some definitions. I'm sure everyone here knows modular forms, harmonic mass forms, um, but just in case there are people here. So a modular form of weight K on some, well, we say gamma is SLTZ, maybe some subgroup of gamma with some character is just some function, some holomorphic function that transforms in this way for every M is A, B, C, D. You just pull out your character and your automorphy factor. It's holomorphic. This should be on H, not gamma, of course. Um, so it's holomorphic on your upper half plane. And there are some growth conditions toward the cusp. So we'll be a bit hand wavy with all these things. We don't need them precisely uh, to state all the theorems in this talk. And then we want to generalize modular forms to half integral weight. So this is really what is used throughout the talk. Um, the only thing that really changes is we add in a couple of extra things in this f of n tau business. So we just pull in um, this epsilon, epsilon sub d, and another character, c on d. So all I'm trying to say with this slide is you have half integral weight modular forms. They exist, they're well-defined in this way. We'll also need harmonic mass forms. So what are these things? These are like modular forms, but they're annihilated by this hyperbolic Laplacian. So the weight K hyperbolic Laplacian is just delta K. It's given here, so it's minus four V squared, d tau, d tau bar, plus two I K V, d tau bar. So weight K harmonic mass forms are just real analytic functions that are annihilated by delta K plus some other conditions. So here's the full definition. Okay, so what does this say? says that a harmonic mass form of weight k, so half integral weight on some subgroup gamma zero n, is a smooth function that transforms in the correct way. So it's modular. So it's just the normal modularity of k's in z. That's the half integral stuff of k's in half z. And we have that it's annihilated by this Laplacian. And condition three just says there's also some growth condition towards the cusps. So it says at each cusp, you can pull out some polynomial pf and the rest of your harmonic mass form decays properly. And analogous conditions at all the cusps. So this is just the condition that it decays nicely towards cusps, essentially. Okay, and then we need to, throughout this talk, we're gonna work with vector valued modular forms. Um, I won't give the full definition here. I'll just give a hand wavy thing of saying, these things can be defined as vector valued modular forms. So what do we need for that? Throughout the talk, we're gonna work on a lattice L. So really this is L comma Q, where Q is some quadratic form on your lattice, okay? And vector valued versions exist on any lattice and you just include this very representation. Okay, I won't say too much about what this is, but there are explicit formulae for very representation and it's all well understood. Throughout, we'll let L prime be the dual lattice and the group ring is C L prime over L and it's basis elements of these math rack E's. So whenever you see a math rack E, you can just think about this as a basis element. It doesn't really matter. And we'll also define this uh, L minus lattice as it's quite useful for us. It's just the same lattice L, but with minus the um, quadratic form. So this just lets us take some negative definite lattice and change it into a positive definite. So this is just for convenience. Okay. and. In this talk, we'll also work with this particular lattice of signature one, two. Okay, so how do I want to say this? Throughout the talk, there will be, most of the results are on signature one, two lattices. Whenever you see quadratic forms, big Q for a quadratic form, this will be this particular lattice here. And then later on, I'll say some stuff about other signatures. But okay, you can just think about, take your favorite lattice of signature one, two, if it happens, to be this lattice with your quadratic form, the determinant, 
then its dual lattice L prime can be identified with a set of all integral binary quadratic forms of some discriminant, which is minus four Q of X. So this allows us to fall back from this kind of abstract vector valued stuff back to scalar valued things that we, we've seen a lot. Okay, and the cycle integrals that we're interested in and we have results on arise as specializations of these general theorems on signature one, two lattices onto this lattice. Okay, so I've said something about cycle integrals here. So Josh, just a quick yeah. question to, to mm -hmm. clarify. So your signature, the first argument is the number of negative eigenvalues, right? No, positive, sorry. Or positive, okay, yeah, just, yeah, so, you know, a lot of people in harmonic mass forms do it this way, and, and people like uh, Jens and Jan Brunier, I mean, do it the other way, so, yeah. Yeah, so this is positive definite, and we kind of want to fix the positive definite as uh, dimensional one, so that we can get pre-images under psi here, nice pre-images under psi. Okay, thanks. Okay, so yeah, I said something about these cycle integrals that we're interested in. So what do they look like? So if you take some modular form, really usually we take a cusp form here and we just hit it with some quadratic form, Q of Z1, the K minus one. Um, all I want to do is kind of give the shape of the cycle integrals that we're interested here. CQ is just some cycle in the up half plane. Um, I'll say a little bit about the trace later on, which is just stick the sum in front of this cycle integral. So we sum over all quadratic forms, and here should be a curly Q. Um, so curly Q is the set of binary quadratic forms of discriminant D. We mod out by the action of some subgroup of gamma, or by gamma itself in this case, and then we just sum as a trace over these cycle integrals. Okay, so I won't go too much into what the cycle integrals are, but I will say, why do we care about them? So there are some major applications of cycle integrals and their traces. Um, so they give special values of L functions. They show up um, when we look at green functions on Grassmannians. So this is an arithmetic geometry kind of business. They also show up in string theory and loop amplitudes in this side, um, which is something I was surprised about. Okay, what else do we need? The other thing in the title of the talk is theta lifts. So what is a theta lift? Um, we can just think of a theta lift, or I think of them as just a map between spaces of modular objects. So you just take your favorite function f, multiply it by a theta function and integrate. This is the basic idea of what a theta lift is. What's the point? The point is there are loads of different choices for this theta function. You're not fixed to one particular choice. We can choose whichever one we want. And so in this talk, we use the Siegel and the Melson theta function. Okay. Uh, here I should say curly f is just the fundamental domain and tau is u plus iv, and here mu is just the invariant measure. So this is du dv over v squared. So here we're integrating over tau. There are theta lifts where you integrate over z instead, and then you're integrating over the Grassmannian, but for us, we just integrate in the tau variable. Okay, so I said Siegel and Milson theta function, what are they? Okay, so now we really fix this lattice, uh, lattice of signature one, two. Okay, for tau and z both in h, the z equal theta function is defined like this. So you just sum over your basis of your um, discriminant group, you sum over the cosets, and you just hit some exponential function. So this is like the analog of the standard theta function, but here we have to do a bit of uh, changing of variables to make sure that everything converges nicely. Here, x sub z is just take an element of your lattice and project onto the line generated by z in your Grassmannian. And the same thing for x z part. So you don't need to worry too much about what these things are. These are just chosen um, to make sure that this thing converges. And this is well understood, this appears everywhere. And so we can just take it as a given. So what's the point? The point is that the Siegel theta function, theta L, transforms like a modular form of some particular weight, so minus one half in this case, for the wave representation rho sub L in tau. So we have some transformation behavior in tau. There's also some transformation behavior in Z, but we don't use it for this talk. And similarly, I said we need the Milson theta function. So it's basically the same. So we have our theta function and we put a star in the top. And all we change is we stick in some polynomial. So this is exactly the same as you would with a standard theta function. And you want to get to a higher weight, 
you've got to stick in some harmonic polynomial. And px of z is some polynomial. I won't describe it particularly. Um, you don't need it for this talk. Um, but this is just a, a modified theta function. And again, the point is that the Milson theta function, uh, theta L star, transforms like a modular form of weight one half for rho L and tau. So we have two modular theta functions that we're going to integrate against. OK. Even better for us is that these things split up. So what do I mean by this? I mean by this is, so in our lattice of signature, say 1, 2, we have a negative definite part and a positive definite part. And importantly, these theta functions are defined such that they split as a theta function on the positive definite part and a theta function on the negative definite part. And it's just the tensor product of these things. So we can really kind of decompose our lattice into two different pieces. If we didn't have this splitting, a lot of these results wouldn't hold in this talk. So later on, I'll say something about lifts where we don't know this. And this is kind of a central point where we need, um, we need the splitting to be able to get rationality results, things like this. So, okay, but for theta L, theta L star, we can just pull this theta function apart into a positive definite and a negative definite version. Okay, so now we get on to kind of previous results. So a bit of history. So Conan and Zagier, they studied some cusp forms that I'm sure lots of people here have seen already. So it's FK, B of Z, some normalization factor, what do we do? We sum some quadratic forms evaluated at Z and one to the minus K. And here this curly B is an equivalence class of indefinite integral binary quadratic forms of discriminant D. Okay, and what do they show with these objects? Well, these are, these are really deep objects and they give an important class of functions whose period functions are rational. And they showed that certain linear, simple linear combinations, um, so these traces of FKB are rational. And with these rationality results, these can play into rationality of special values of L functions and things. So here we see our cycle integral again. Now we specialize at this FK, this should be a curly B, but it gives a hint as what's changing later on. So this is a curly B really. So we take the traces of the cycle integral and these things are rational. Okay, and you've kind of guessed it by this, uh, this mistake here. So what do we do? We want to change this curly B. So what happens if we change curly B into curly A, okay? So now we let A denote an equivalence class of positive definite integral binary quadratic forms. And now I've switched big D to little d just to make it clear there's a difference. Okay, but we take exactly the same shape as what was before. What are these things? These are meromorphic modular forms. So these now have poles. But we can ask similar sorts of questions. Can we get cycle integrals with rational coefficients? Okay, so here I just note that F is a meromorphic modular form. It's got weight 2K and it decays like a cusp form. So everything behaves nicely. So the only thing we need to worry about is this being meromorphic. Does this cause any issues? It turns out it doesn't. Okay, so now we get on to maybe some more nailed down definitions. So we're gonna fix gamma is SL2Z because we do vector valued versions. The only thing we need to worry about is SL2Z. We let uh, curly QD as a set of integral binary quadratic forms of some non-square discriminant. And here is our particular cycle. So C sub Q is we take the action of this, um, so we take the stabilizer of Q um, in gamma, this is gamma Q, we mod um, the CQ, this geodesic, by the action of gamma Q. What is this geodesic? Here we just fix solutions of this Q of Z1 equals zero. Yeah, so it's just AZ squared plus BX plus C equals zero. Um, and this you can clearly see is just associated to each of our quadratic forms. Then what do we do? We're interested in exactly the same things as before. So all I do is change the curly B that we had before to a curly A now. All right, so these are the traces that we're interested in. 
Right, so we'll take Z sub curly A is some CM point in our half plane. And this is associated to a unique reduced form Q sub zero. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this just means that ZA is the unique solution of Q, Q zero, Z one equals zero in H. <coughs> okay, since ZA is a CM point, we can define two sub lattices of L. So there's a bit of work that goes into showing this, um, but this is all known, this is written probably by V, people before that. But this just means that you can split your lattice up into a positive definite and a negative definite part. Okay, so here I'm cheating a little bit. So ZA and H, I also denote by Z the point or the line in the Grassmannian. So there's an identification going on here between a point in the upper half plane and a line in your Grassmannian. So a line in this lattice basically. But anyway, we use the letter Z because these things can be identified. So we'll just ignore that technicality for now and just switch freely. So now I have P and N is two sub lattices and P is one dimensional and positive definite. N is two dimensional and negative definite. And even better, P plus N has finite index in L. So we're not losing too much by doing this. This is the, the way to think about this. Okay, in everything that follows, we can just replace theta by theta star and a curly G by a curly G star later on. So that means we just show the results for the Siegel theta function, but this Milson theta function stuff is basically the same. And it's basically the same as long as we take care of the weights and a few factors. Okay, so the usual vector value theta function, which is this theta P associated to the positive definite part P is a holomorphic modular form of weight one half for some representation. So let's denote by curly GP plus is the holomorphic part of a harmonic mass form, curly GP. This has got weight three halves and it maps to theta P under psi. So I'm sure everyone knows the psi operator. So it's just uh, two I and V to the K bar of D tau bar. And so GP plus is just the pre-image under psi. And I'm sure people can see where this is going. This is the thing that allows us to get back to mock theta functions or harmonic mass forms. Okay, so we also need a weakly holomorphic modular form. So we're gonna take F is just some weakly holomorphic modular form. For us, it has weights three halves minus K and satisfies the kind of plus space condition, all of these things. But we just remember that C sub F are just the Fourier coefficients. That's all we really need. Okay, so here's the main theorem. It looks a bit scary. So take some even weight, um, assume that ZA does not lie on the geodesics. So it just means these things are defined and things are non-zero. Then what do we have? Then we have this combination of traces of cycle integrals is up to some factor. And this side is the constant term in some Fourier expansion. Okay, so what are all these things on the right hand side? Okay, so CT, it's just the constant term in the Fourier expansion. Langle Wrangle is just some natural bilinear form. So you can think of this as just multiplied together. Um, and here, these brackets are the ranking current brackets. So bracket sub n is the mth ranking current bracket. So this is some combination of your harmonic mass form and theta n minus. And remember, n minus is now a positive definite lattice. So this is just some theta function. Okay, great, so it looks a bit complicated. What's the point? The point is in this horrible green that all of the terms on the right-hand side can be chosen to be rational. This has rational coefficients. So F is just some weakly holomorphic modular form. So this is rational. GP plus can be chosen to be rational. Theta N minus is just some theta function is rational. So the right-hand side, everything is easily chosen to be rational. On the left hand side, this is not obvious at all that this thing is rational. So we have some elegant proof just by a theta lift um, that this thing on the left hand side is rational. Okay, I should also say that we also give results for odd K, generic signature one comma two lattices. Um, these are all in the paper. Okay, so now we get to some technical kind of business. So how does this proof go? So we want to prove 
this statement here. So the proof of the more general analog of this theorem goes in three main steps. Okay. First, we have to identify the trace on the left-hand side as the iterated raising of a locally harmonic mass form. So for people who know about this already in this curly F um, sub one minus KD, the iterated raising of this is gonna be the trace. We take the output of step one and we relate this to a sequel theta lift. And then we concentrate on the theta lift and we just compute this as the constant term that we see on the right hand side. So these three, three steps sound pretty easy. One is basically already known by work of uh, Stefan Lodwig and Markus Schwagenscheid. Um, step two is a bit of work and step three is where the main, main theorems come in. Okay, so the first step is these traces as iterative raisings. So we have our trace on the left-hand side. And here I say that Schwagenscheid and Lobrich, what did they show? They showed that these traces are basically an iterated raising of this curly F4 minus KD, evaluated at our CM point. Okay, so this is basically known. What's everything here? Here, R sub kappa to the N is just your raising operator iterated N times. So we just fix the weight kappa so here, curly F1 minus K has weight two minus two K. So the end one, we have to hit it with a two minus two K and we keep doing that until we raise it to the correct weight. That's what we do here. So what is this curly F1 minus KD for people who haven't seen it? This is some particular example of, I think it's fair to say it's relatively new um, and it's called a locally harmonic mass form. So what is a locally harmonic mass form? Um, I guess I'll just say it in words. So this is something that behaves like a harmonic mass form, apart from an exceptional set of density zero. So just a set of density zero, where it has for us jump singularities. I think the actual definition, it doesn't need to be jump singularities, um, but for us, this means that everything converges nicely. So there are no, there are no points where the exceptional set forces things to diverge. That's what I want to say. So where does this come from? This curly F1 minus KD, well, it's introduced by Bringman, Kane, and Conan in the scalar valued case. Um, I think in the weight zero case, a vector valued version is also discovered by Hervel in his thesis. And to work with our more general theorems, in the paper, we also describe a vector valued version of this. Um, so I said that everything we prove is vector valued. And so we really need to generalize this to be a vector valued thing. Um, but this generalization is pretty easy. Okay, so what do we show? So the second step is showing that the locally harmonic mass form, the iterative raising is a sequel theta lift. So what do we show? We show that this combination, so here's just our coefficients of F, some power of D. So the iterative raising is up to a constant our sequel theta lift that we want. And now we have some bilinear pairing um, because everything's vector valued. But we could ignore these, ignore this comma, and then we'll see that this is, this is just the shape of a theta lift. Okay, so how do you show this? You basically just compute. You sit down, do it naively, and compute the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So the left-hand side, you can just compute the action of these raisings on F, um, and it just spits out a formula in terms of Gauss hypergeometric functions. And on the right-hand side, you just unfold. So I guess everyone here has heard of unfolding at least and knows the vague techniques, um, but it's just a standard technique and just run through this argument. Okay, so the third step is where things really come in. So we want to compute the theta lift. So I claim that using Stokes theorem, and some ideas of Bonnier, Erlen, and Yang in a recent paper, that this regularized theta integral can be evaluated as this constant term. So we take the output of the previous slide, and now we just want to evaluate it as some constant term. And this is the constant term that appears in the main theorem. Okay. So a sketch of the proof. So I won't give all the details, but I'll give some of the main, the main details. So. 
using the self jointness. I don't know if this is a technical term, but it appears in Hune El and Yang, so I used it. Um, we can basically switch the iterative raising from one side to the other. We pull out some factor of minus one, but this allows us to move the iterative raising from any F. So here we choose F to be weakly holomorphic. Um, so on the right-hand side, technically we should um, obtain a boundary term as well, but one can show that this vanishes in this case. So we've switched our raising to the second. Okay, and then what's the point? We want to be able to split. So here, where are these things coming from? Where's GP plus and theta n minus? This is coming from the splitting of our Siegel theta function over to theta p and theta n minus. So we have to split this function here somehow. And how does this work? Well, one can show that the raising of say L minus kappa or V to the kappa GT bar or G tau bar tensor H tau is V to the kappa G tau bar tensor RL of H tau bar for every holomorphic function G and smooth function H. So what's this saying? This is saying that if I have some holomorphic function G then the raising kind of skips it. Yeah. So the raising only acts on H. So the intermediate terms where you'd think about doing this differentiation by the product rule, they just vanish because this is holomorphic. So anyway, one can show this identity and this allows us to pull the raising into our H, which for us is gonna be this theta n minus business. Okay, so we use this on the Siegel theta function. And what do we get? Okay, so here, what is L three halves GP? This is just theta P. This is just by definition, because remember that GP is the pre-image under psi. And so the raising skips most of GP and it just hits theta N minus. Well, that's fine. Theta N minus we can deal with because we don't want the coefficients of that. So remember right at the beginning, I said, where are these mock theta functions coming from? They're always coming from this GP. Okay, and here I should say that L sub kappa is the lowering operator or the psi operator. Okay, so there's a bit more rewriting to be done. One can rewrite this. So this is a technique of Grunier, Elan, and Yang um, that we generalized a little bit or I should say more correctly that they wrote down in the scalar valued case, we wrote down in the vector valued case, um, that the right hand side, your output of this raising, you can recognize this as just the lowering of your ranking current brackets. So this is just a proposition. Um, so the more general proposition writes that the ranking current bracket of two objects can be written as the sum, so a two variable sum involving some gamma functions and these lowering and raisings. In this particular case, because we choose things nicely, one of these sums cancels. One of the sums vanishes, and so we just get one ranking current bracket and one thing here. Okay, so now what have we got? So if we just plug this back in to the integral, so we have the integral over some curly F, so our uh, fundamental domain, and we've pulled everything to the right-hand side, and we have some lowering operator of a ranking current bracket. So what do we do? Well, now we have a differential operator on the outside, and so we can just apply Stokes' theorem. Again, this is a bit technical, and there are some boundary terms arising, um, but this is basically done in Brunier's habilitation, is what we followed. And basically everything cancels, apart from this constant term. So I think the things on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the fundamental domain uh, cancel by modularity. Um, and the constant term arises as the, I believe the truncation point at the top. But anyway, everything goes like in Brunier's habilitation or Brunier and Yang, things like this. So this is all just a standard formula. Okay, so that was a bit uh, abstract. So let's get down to some examples. So let's take the class A, um, fix your quadratic form is one, zero, one, and fix a CM point, say I, for this quadratic form. Then theta P, 
is this Jacobi theta function that everyone knows. It's just the sum over n e of n squared tau. What's the point? The point is that Zagier showed that GP plus for this particular P is the generating function of the Hurwitz class numbers and some factors of four floating around from pi's. Okay. In particular, this GP plus is the holomorphic part of a harmonic mass form, weight three halves, that maps to theta p under psi three halves. So in our formula, we can just plug in some of its class numbers. Okay, so let's choose k equals two. So the lowest weight we can choose in our examples. Um, so this forces the ranking cohen bracket to vanish. So there's no ranking cohen bracket, it's just directly gp plus and theta n minus. And we'll choose f to be the unique weakly holomorphic modular form whose Fourier expansion begins e of minus d tau plus o of one. So why do we choose these things? This is basically to get the easiest examples we can. So on the right hand side here, when we consider these ranking cohen brackets, one really has to plug in the Fourier expansion for GP plus theta n minus and compute these ranking cohen brackets. So for a nice example, you want to make these as small as possible. Okay, so what do we get? We get that the trace of these things is some L value, so this is LD minus one, minus some sum of its class numbers, which I think is really beautiful. So we just pull out this LD is just coming from uh, a constant term. Um, so a constant term in the harmonic mass form and these HDs are what we really care about. Okay, so what else can we get? So similarly, if we just raise the weight, so we say, okay, K is four now, and then we really have a ranking cone bracket. We see that we get something very similar, but we also pull out a polynomial in front. And you'll see that these kind of uh, these things here. So here we have n squared minus m squared, the same again. So we can see that this is clearly coming from our theta n minus. It's clearly coming from the negative definite two dimensional thing. And here, this is just a consequence of the ranking current brackets. So it's just a consequence of having this iterated raising operator that eventually gave us ranking current brackets. Okay, what else can we get out? We don't just have Hertz class numbers. Let's do something partitioning. So let's take the smallest parts function. So I'm sure lots of people know this. It just counts the number of smallest parts in the integer partitions of n. But let Sn be SPT of n plus this combination of P of n. Um, and so Sn is known to have um, a pre-image, oh, sorry, that is harmonic mass form, the correct weight for us. Okay, so let's just plug all these choices in, see what we get. Okay, so here we actually have to take a combination of two traces. Um, so here we see two different quadratic forms appearing. But what do we get out? Again, we get some L value and we just get some sum over these uh, S of N functions. So partition functions with some character. So again, we have these weird traces of cycle integrals on the left-hand side as something very concrete and down to earth on the right-hand side. Okay, and for k equals four, we can do something similar. And again, we see we just, all the changes really is we obtain some polynomial factor in front. Everything else is similar. Okay, so if you're interested, a little plug for the paper, here's where you can find it. It's also appearing in a journal in a few months, I think. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit, so I might be a bit fast, but we'll see, um, about some ongoing projects and research program in general. So what do we want to know about? So for me, um, this curly F one minus KD, is, so this is kind of fundamental in these works I've talked about so far, but we don't know that much about it. So Aylin, Gertzoy, Kian, and Larry um, showed that in the weight zero case, um, F0D is still a locally harmonic mass form, um, still converges, everything like this. And it's related to the vanishing of twisted L values. So it really holds some arithmetic significance. 
You can naturally extend this weight zero case to be vector valued as well. Um, so this is what Herbel did. And you can also take the definition of this paper um, and just extend it directly. Okay, so what do I want to know about? I want to know about the kudler milson lift of F0D. So I said right at the beginning when I was talking about these theta functions or theta lifts, sorry, that you can also lift over the Grassmannian and the kudler milson lift is one of these lifts. So instead of integrating over tau, you integrate over Z. And the kudler milson lift has a lot of important applications and it's well studied and appears everywhere. So what is the kudler milson lift of F0D? It takes weight zero to weight three halves. So we get something of weight three halves spat out at the end. But there were some difficulties to overcome here. Um, so because F0D has these singularities over geodesics, we've got to be very careful. Um, so the way that the kudler milson lift works is that we also need to put, so under pre-images, certain pre-images, there are poles. And you have to put a ball around one of these poles or each of these poles and make it vanish um, in a limit as epsilon tends to zero. And we want to do something similar for the geodesics. So maybe one can put um, a tube around each of these geodesics in the upper half plane and then let uh, the size of these tubes go to zero. However, there are a lot of boundary integrals and technical conditions that are going to have to be overcome here. Okay, this is one direction that I'd, I'd be happy to think about with anyone. Um, other signatures. So here I said, we only consider signature one comma two. Okay, but what happens in other signatures? What can I change? Okay, so currently I'm writing up some results on the following problem. So use a combination of techniques of Cournier, Il and Yang. So everything we've spoken about so far and a recent preprint of Pony and Schwagenscheid to determine further relations from mock theta functions, harmonic mass forms, um, by considering similar lifts, but on Lorentzian lattices. What's a Lorentzian lattice? This is just change this two to an N. So what does that mean? That means that our theta P, the positive definite is still one dimensional. So we still get these coefficients of harmonic mass forms, mock theta functions, um, but in more generality. We know we're no longer restricted to have a, a two here, we can have an N. So Brunier, Ellen Yang, and uh, the paper that I talked about earlier, basically does this in general for signature one comma two. Brunier Schwagenscheid does this in general for signature one comma N, but without iterated raising. And so what happens in the middle? What happens at the interface of these two things? Um, this is what I'm writing up. Um, it's not too different to what one would expect. It's basically a smashing of these results together. Um, but we can get some interesting results on the coefficients of mock theta functions, for example. Okay, what else can we do? So in other signatures, we can also work on lattices of signature one comma n, like I said. So joint with Paulina Scharf and Marcus Schwagenscheid. I'm also investigating the question of how can we produce these locally harmonic mass forms in hyperbolic n space? So hyperbolic n space is signature one comma n. So how does one produce new examples of functions that look like curly f? So what can we do? We can take a theta lift similar to the Siegel theta lift, but we also change our theta function a little bit. So we insert a different polynomial essentially that forces things to be harmonic. Okay, so we want to answer the question or I'd like to answer the question in the future is, is there a way to define families of locally harmonic mass forms without theta lifts? So to me, it feels like these theta lift constructions are kind of isolated. You take some theta function that happens to work, plug it in, produce a theta lift, you have some locally harmonic mass form. Great, what's next? Now you have to modify the theta function again and find another example of families. But can we go the other way or is there a more refined structure of these locally harmonic mass forms where we don't just have this generating by theta lifts, but is there some nuance to these locally harmonic mass form? Um, and so by constructing more examples with Paolo and Marcus, we hope to answer some of these questions. So we have results on how to construct these. Um, we just need to write it up in the correct way. Okay, 
And then the big overarching theme that I'd like to keep thinking about is results on rationality. So here we said that one of the main results of the paper that's published is that on the right hand side, we get things that are rational. And then we get L functions that are rational, L values, um, traces of cycle intervals are rational, things like this. Okay, so what do we need for this? We really need these pre images of theta functions under psi to have rational coefficients. So this uh, GP plus for us, because it's one dimensional, is easy. There's always something rational as long as it's the correct weight. Are there more functions like this that we can find with psi pre images with rational coefficients? As soon as you find things like that, you can start plugging them into theta lifts, obtaining rationality results. So the main question is find nice pre images under psi of uh, theta functions in higher dimensions with rational coefficients. And we also want to be able to relate the left-hand side. Um, so these, where before we had traces of cycle integrals to nice things, to things we care about, so cycle integrals, L values. It's all well and good being able to produce these theta lifts and say they're rational, but who cares if they don't actually give rationality results on something. Okay, so the main overriding principle is use these guiding principles of the previous works and determine rationality results on more families of objects. Um, I also should say here that the rationality that we need, like I said earlier, is determined by the splitting of these theta functions. So we have to choose our Siegel theta function, Milson theta function in a, a nice enough way that they split over the positive definite and negative definite parts. Otherwise we have no hope of these techniques. So as one starts to construct more examples of locally harmonic mass forms, you have to choose these theta functions in a very special way to be able to split them up over P and N. Is there kind of a uniform way to be able to split a more generic family of theta functions into P and N? As soon as you have that, then you have a hope of discovering rationality results. Without that, there's no hope. Okay, so I was pretty quick, um, but if anyone's working on similar things, wants to get in contact, feel free to just drop me a message. Um, Either we can talk about it here or just drop me an email. So yeah, I was maybe eight minutes past, so apologies. All right, well, let's thank Josh. Um, no, I don't think, oh, eight minutes fast, yeah. Um, yeah, let's thank the speaker again. Um, I'll do it the German way maybe. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions for Josh? I have a quick, just like a uh, clarifying question because I think I maybe missed it. Yeah, sure. uh, are the did you say that the Siegel theta function and Milson theta functions are different weights? One of them was like weight, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's I guess cool. maybe I'm more interested in in the uh, positive definite parts. Are they the same weights or are they not? Uh, no, these are different weights. They're different weights. Okay, so because uh, in the examples you gave with like the Siegel theta functions, it, it was then related to like weight three halves uh, harmonic MOS form stuff. Mm -hmm. So with the Milson one, do you get like weight one half harmonic MOS form things? Like how, what exactly, where uh, do these, I guess? Ah, sorry. So this is the same weight in the Milson and Siegel theta function, but there is a way to de um, define a slightly different theta function, which is um, pournier schwagenscheid So they basically include a different polynomial here um, that forces the weight of theta p star to be three halves. So you really get classical mock theta functions in the end. You take a pre yeah, I was curious, cause this seems like it should be related or the rationality results should be related to um, like Bernier and Ono's stuff with the, their paper on like Heitner divisors. And I was wondering, cause there's like a clear uh, tie in to something with like values of L functions um, where they yeah. have you know, something. And Herbal's work is related to that too, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just curious if there were, were like just natural nice uh, examples where it tied into that. Yeah, yeah. So this is Brunier um, Schwagenscheid, and also what I'm writing up at the moment is, is a modified version of this. Yeah. So when you go from weight one half to three halves, Josh, um, mm -hmm. do you, can you do it by taking a derivative in like a Jacobi variable or? So you mean in finding this pre-image or? 
Uh, well, you said that Brunier defines like wave three halves versions of these things. Could mm -hmm. if they have a Jaco if they're theta, is there a way? I mean, often you can just differentiate to raise the weight by one or something like that, or do they insert some other factor? Or just Question. like so how does it work? The factor that they insert is you choose some isotropic vector in your lattice. Okay. Uh, project to Z and then take a uh, take your inner product with your lattice vector with Z. Mm -hmm. oh, with LZ, sorry. So some other polynomial. Um, but you might be able to take a derivative, but not that I've seen. I see. Okay. Um, actually, I was thinking about your, your last slide. You, you said you want to find examples that have pre-images that are rational. Right. The weight one half and three halves are special. Um, mm -hmm. Outside of those weights, it's just going to be CM forms, right? Do that have a chance? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we were talking recently a little bit about that and some of the stuff that Stefan Elin is doing. Um, but those would be the type of examples you would want to look at, I guess, right? Would be CM yeah. forms and some of the work of uh, Dukley and Brunier and uh, Elon. Um, and you'd want to lift some of those CM forms, right? Exactly. Anything where we have a hope of getting something rational at the end mm -hmm. seems interesting for this, yeah. Great, yeah. So there's all this work in weight in weight one, which is already written down in the literature that I guess you could start with, and then other weights. It said sounds like Stefan is writing up stuff. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully, um, hopefully I'll get to it in the next few years. Yeah, and all that can be plugged into your machinery to to give some results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Great. Uh, other questions. Can I ask a question about the Hurwitz class number formulas and so on that you had? Our, our priority, the sums you're writing down are infinite. Is uh, H just vanishing when the D is negative there? D oh, minus sorry. N squared minus M squared is negative? Yeah, sorry, I should have said this, yeah. So these are finite formulas. Mm -hmm. And about the self-adjointness that you brought up, is, mm -hmm. is that on a finite dimensional Hilbert space of of these forms or is that on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space? Good question. Um, uh, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, so for this, this is contained in uh, Cournier's habilitation. I'd have to look at look at this again. What was the, in, the inner product again? So the inner product is just on this um, finite dimensional group ring. So C L prime model. Yeah, uh, I don't know if it's, well, when you deal with weakly holomorphic and stuff, I mean, things can be infinite dimensional spaces, mm -hmm. but if you bound the order of the pole, they're finite dimensional. So you can always kind of restrict yourself in any example to finite dimensional cases. So it's sort of like, isn't maybe it is infinite dimensional, but like, you know, a lot of these cases, the things are, are infinite dimensional in theory, but in any fine, for any, any finite set of things, lies in a finite dimensional subspace or something. Um, oh, I, was, I was just trying to get at the self-adjointness of the raising operator. I yeah. understand that this is a subtle point. And since yeah. I've run, it, run into this problem in other situations, that's why I'm in, in this stuff. But I, maybe you're, you're controlling your things at the cusp so there aren't any problems. I, I, that's why I inquired. I wasn't after anything in the question. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd have to look this up again. So it's been a couple of years since we started work on this. So. Thanks. Okay, other questions? Well, if not, let's uh, thank Josh again, especially for coming on such short notice.